It is the pinnacle of professional wrestling. Over the course of a month, in the boiling summer heat, the very best athletes to ever span the globe compete in the toughest tournament in the game. This is the story of the G1 Climax. I'm Kevin Kelly, and this is The Recount. On July 6, 2019, fans from all over the world will gather in Dallas, Texas, as the 29th G1 Climax kicks off in the American Airlines Center, then across Japan from Hokkaido to Tokyo's Budokan. Thousands will come together as one to witness the best in the world fight to decide who is the one. Holding tournament matches outside of Japan for the first time indicates how the G1 captures imaginations all over the globe. As prestigious and storied the nearly three decades of the tournament proper is, this journey is longer still. In fact, to trace the origins of the G1 all the way back means to look to the spring of 1974, with competitors the world over looking to make a name for themselves in New Japan, Antonio Inoki devised the World League, a battle to determine the best wrestlers, both within and outside Japan, culminating in a playoff match. The league began in controversial fashion when Inoki, Seiji Sakaguchi, and Karl Krupp ended their campaigns with the same point total leading to a series of three playoff matches in which Inoki came out on top. In 1978, the World League became known as the MSG Series. 41 years before New Japan action came to Madison Square Garden, the tournament was conceived to bring the excitement of MSG to Japan. Andre the Giant would go undefeated in this first single block league, but lost in the final to runner-up Inoki. Inoki earned the top prize of wrestling then WWF champion Bob Backlund. The MSG series was prestigious indeed, but the visionary Inoki foresaw a time where NJPW would be the centerpiece of pro wrestling the world over and not just in Japan. With that in mind, he created a governing body to run a new kind of annual tournament. One called the International Wrestling Grand Prix, IWGP. The first IWGP series in 1983 included competitors from Europe, Central and North America, and Japan, battling it out in a single block round robin league. The two top point scorers, Antonio Inoki, and a young rising American superstar named Hulk Hogan. Although Hogan's easy charisma and striking look saw a large and growing fan base surround him in Japan, Inoki was the favorite to add another trophy to his massive collection. The results of the match, however, sent shockwaves through NJPW. With Inoki positioned on the apron, Hogan charged in with an axe bomber that sent the founder crashing to the concrete floor. Unable to respond to the 20 count, Inoki's unconscious body was lifted onto a stretcher as Hogan's hand was raised in victory. Hulk Hogan was the first IWGP winner, but his title was not a regularly defended one. Instead, the next year's IWGP series winner would face Hogan for the championship belt. Inoki would redeem himself in 1984 before successfully defending his crown in the coming years. That meant overcoming arch rival Masa Saito in 1987 to become the first recognized IWGP heavyweight champion with the title to be regularly defended from here on. Inoki held the title for 325 days, but he vacated due to a foot injury. He was leaving the landscape in the midst of a massive change. A new breed of athlete was reaching its prime in New Japan. While Ricky Choshu and Tatsumi Fujinami had been on top for most of the 80s, the dawn of a new decade saw the dawn of new stars. Big Van Vader, Crusher Bam Bam Bigelow, and Scott Flash Norton were fearsome foreign powerhouses with unbelievable athletic prowess. Then there was a trio of young phenoms, all having entered the New Japan Dojo within days of each other, who pundits were calling the Three Musketeers of Fighting Spirit. 
brutal striker Shinya Hashimoto, technical master Masahiro Chono, and charismatic high flyer Keiji Muto. New Japan president Seiji Sakaguchi saw these eight men as the very best the wrestling world had to offer. A tournament comprised of these elite eight in two blocks of four was what the horse racing world would call the grade one of competition. A far cry from the month-long war of the modern tournament, one night in Nagoya followed by three in Ryogoku Sumo Hall nevertheless began a summer tradition, the G1 Climax. While clouds gathered over Ryogoku, 30 degree heat outside was molten inside Sumo Hall as fans witnessed a tempestuous bout for the first G1 final. It was Chono's grounded and methodical brutality against Muto's dynamism, but both competitors would rip pages from each other's playbook. Chono would dive at Muto outside of the ring one minute, yet go for a pile driver on the concrete the next. In the closing stretch, both men would lock in Cobra Twists, their use of Inoki's signature move driving home the fact that both finalists had earned their master's mantle as New Japan Ace. Ultimately, Mudo fell to a powerbomb. In a gesture usually reserved for sumo tournament victories, exuberant fans hurled seating cushions into the air, an iconic visual that permanently burned itself into history. Chono would again invoke Inoki with his closing address, yelling Ich, Ni, San, Da, a mark of respect and declaration of intent all in one. Chono honored his past, but made it clear that the present belonged to him. The next summer, Chono reinforced that point. The 1992 G1 took the form of a 16-man single elimination tournament. Chono would defeat Rick Rude with a flying shoulder tackle to win the second G1 Climax and lift the vacant NWA World Heavyweight Championship in the process. The first decade of the G1 Climax saw the tournament take on different forms and different field sizes. 1993, 1997, and 98 adopted the 1992 single elimination format, while other years took a block format with two blocks of five or six, or in the unique case of 2000, four blocks of five wrestlers each, including the first junior heavyweights to compete in the G1, Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Jushin Thunder Liger. The structure for the tournament may not have been consistent in the 1990s, but one thing was the dominance of the three Musketeers. 1995 saw the second All-Musketeer G1 final as Muto squared off against the man he had taken the IWGP Heavyweight Championship from just weeks earlier, Shinya Hashimoto. Hashimoto's second IWGP reign had lasted over a year, and the hard-hitting King of Destruction seemed all but invincible. Yet Muto pulled off the near impossible at that year's Don Taku and looked to repeat the feat later in the summer. Hashimoto would stand on the brink of victory, pummeling Muto with kicks and landing a DDT to reopen stitches from a head wound his opponent picked up earlier in the tournament. The IWGP champion showed his tenacity though and landed a pair of moonsaults to win. Afterwards stating that from here on, he would only continue to explode on the biggest stages. Hashimoto would finally beat the one in 1998, felling a shocking opponent in Kazuyu Yamazaki. Despite initially graduating from the New Japan Dojo in the early 1980s, Yamazaki had spent roughly a decade away from New Japan, appearing in UWF and then its successor UWFI. When that promotion invaded New Japan in 1995, Yamazaki would cross back over to his original promotion for the remainder of his active career, yet there was still an interpromotional pride and clash of styles in the final. That clash led to a very physical match between the two, one that ended by a Hashimoto brainbuster and an emotional embrace with Yamazaki afterward. The three-night run was the peak of Yamazaki's in-ring career, and even in defeat, he found true acceptance from the New Japan fans and from Hashimoto as a standard bearer. It wasn't the first time that human drama was at the heart of the G1 Climax. 
While the early years of the tournament were shorter than modern G1s, multiple matches in the same night made them just as intense and made survival just as much of a theme. Nothing exemplified the spirit of survival like Ricky Choshu's legendary 1996 G1 campaign. Age 45, and with a deep talent pool of young legends in the making around him, many speculated that Choshu's time at the very top of the business was over. Yet Choshu would sweep an intimidating block made up of Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Kensuke Sasaki, Shinya Hashimoto, and Junji Hirata, putting himself in the final opposite Masahiro Chono. This was no longer the Chono who had yelled Antonio Inoki's signature Da in 1991, no longer the respectful young technician. Angered by the spotlight garnered by Hashimoto and Muto's IWGP reigns over his own work, Chono would join forces with Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masa Saito to form the Okami Gundan. Chono was now a black-clad, black-hearted badass and railed against the NJPW traditions and establishment that Choshu clearly represented. Ultimately, willed on by contemporary and rival Tatsumi Fujinami, Choshu landed a barrage of Ricky Lariats before submitting Chono for a tear-jerking victory. Although he was the runner-up in 1996, it's safe to say that Chono truly owned the G1 Climax in its early years. He would, after all, earn the nickname of Mr. August. Such was his summer dominance. Chono only held the IWGP Heavyweight Championship for one short month in his entire career, but he was the man to look to when it came to summer performances, with five of the first 15 names etched on the G1 trophy being his. Yet Chono's last two G1 triumphs came during tumultuous times for New Japan Pro Wrestling. In the midst of an MMA boom and faced with challenges and transitions both in ring and behind the scenes, New Japan's popularity was waning and professional wrestling in Japan was entering dark winter years. Hiroyoshi Tenzan's impressive three wins in four years in 2003, 4, and 6 mirrored the accomplishments of his mentor Chono 12 years before but were achieved in front of smaller crowds. Tenzan's 2006 victory was the most emotional of the three, obtained after an emotional war with friend and rival Satoshi Kojima. Kojima and Tenzan's careers had been linked together since their dojo days. But when Kojima defected for All Japan Pro Wrestling, they would clash violently over the IWGP and Triple Crown Championships through 2005. Kojima would pull out all the stops including a daring top rope Frankensteiner and Tenzan's own Anaconda Vice. But the cornered rabid bull that was Tenzan fought back. Two moonsaults and two TTDs scored Tenzan a resounding victory. Tenzan's third G1 win was a war that showed the persevering fighting spirit in the face of darkness in the wrestling world. His first ignited a spark that led New Japan back in the limelight, beating a young firebrand by the name of Hiroshi Tanahashi. If you're a fan of the recount, let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.